You're listening to Renewing Religion, a podcast about worship, social duties, and spirituality featuring an overview of Imam al-Ghazali's Ihya. This podcast is brought to you by Seekers Hub. This Ramadan, our goal is to raise $75,000 in monthly donations to build a global Islamic seminary so that dedicated students all over the world can complete their journeys and become Islamic scholars. You can help them by becoming a monthly donor at seekershub.org slash donate. الذي لم يلد ولم يولد ولم يكن له كفوا أحد والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن ولا اللهم صل على سيدنا ومولانا محمد الفاتح لما أغلق الخاتم لما سبق ناصر الحق بالحق والهادي إلى صراط الله المستقيم وعلى آله حق قدره ومقداره العظيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته كيف حالكم؟ الحمد لله Today we're looking at the topic and the chapter of enjoining the good and forbidding the evil And if you recall, the last two chapters were about the importance of uh, maintaining one's character when we are dealing with different sorts of people in society and the importance of khuluq and the rights that others have upon us. And then Imam Ghazali, rahimullah, the next chapter after that was the chapter of uh, the benefits of travel or residency. And now he's turning his attention to al-amru bil-ma'roof wa nahi wa anil munkar enjoining the good and encouraging the good and forbidding and refraining, helping others to refrain from doing evil. He divides the chapter into a number of very important topics. So first he begins with the importance of enjoining the good and forbidding the wrong. And then he looks at the conditions or the shurut or the etiquettes of doing that. And he looks at some of the integrals of enjoining the good and forbidding the wrong. He looks, for example, at the one who is doing that. He looks at the topic that one is uh, either enjoining or encouraging others not to do. Uh, He looks at the one who is being enjoined upon or prohibited upon. And then he looks at the various gradations of uh, enjoining the good and forbidding the evil the various modalities that one would be able to employ uh, according to the Sharia in doing that. And then lastly, he looks at the adab and the etiquettes of doing that. So we're going to look at some elements of that uh, and try to piece it, piece them all together into a theme. To begin, let's look at a very uh, important hadith uh, of his sallallahu alayhi wasallam, and one I think that most of us know and one that most of us have recourse to when we speak about enjoining the good and forbidding the wrong. So this hadith, مَنْ رَأَى مِنْكُمْ مُنْكَرًا فَلْيُغَيِّرْهُ بِيَدِهِ So when one of you sees something which is wrong, let him try to change it with his hand. فَإِنْ لَمْ يَسْتَطِعْ and if he is unable to do that, then with his tongue, with words, with speech. And if he's not able to do that with his tongue and with speech and words, then let him feel it to be wrong in his or her heart. And that is the weakest of faith. That is the weakest of iman. So this text gives us a wonderful opportunity to study the way meaning is taken from a text. Because the text itself literally says, if you see a wrong, then change it with your hand. And if you can't, then with words, with your tongue. And if you can't, 
then at least feel it wrong in your heart, and that's the weakest of faith. So taken literally, the text would suggest to us on a superficial reading, go and, go and do it. <laughs> go and change it. You see anything that's wrong? If you think it's wrong, man ra'a, whoever sees, man ra'a munkaran. You see something wrong? Go change it. And if you can't, then speak out against it. And if you can't, then at least think it's wrong in your heart, and that's the lowest level or the weakest level of Iman. So that's the text. Now the way that ulama have understood this text is very profound and very beautiful, and it has many lessons for the student of ilm, for you and for me. One is that no text can be understood apart from a number of principles in deen. So the text has a meaning. And deriving the meaning of the text, or looking at the semantics of the text, requires us to use a field in the Islamic sciences called usul al-fiqh, or legal theory. And that study of universal linguistic laws and axioms helps us to derive semantics and the meaning, from, the meaning from the text, which is really the science of hermeneutics. So using usul al-fiqh is essential to understanding a text. Those linguistic universals, the universal laws, that when applied, allow us to draw meaning from a text consistently, logically, and coherently. And don't allow me to impose my own arbitrary or subjective view on the text. Because if each one of us interpreted the text as we want, as we see, we would have as many interpretations as there are interpreters. So the study of usul al-fiqh. Number two is the text needs to be understood within the broad parameters of the qawa'id of deen, the general principles of deen that are taken um, inductively from the fiqh of deen, the general broad al-qawa'id al-amma, the general principles of deen. And then the text needs to be understood also in light of the maqasid of deen, the higher objectives of deen. That is the application of the text must produce benefit because all of deen is ultimately about drawing benefit and repelling harm and all of that is essentially about gaining benefit if we want to singularly look at the objective of deen of Islam. So the higher objectives of the law in the realization of the benefits of deen, of life, of intellect, of family, of property. So no text can be applied isolated from the maqasid or the higher objectives of deen. Because the higher objectives of deen impel us and compel us to apply law in a way to achieve and actualize benefit maslaha and repel harm. So when the ulama look at this text, they draw the following. So these are some of what Imam Ghazali rahimullah, speaks about. Uh, some of that drawn together for the purposes, inshallah, of us, of me and you, learning about the deeper dimensions of this text and the deeper dimensions in general of enjoining the good and forbidding the evil. Number one, if I see it wrong, if I see it wrong, is it really a wrong? Because <laughs> oftentimes, we would deem something wrong, that is, well, it's not wrong. I think it's wrong. But because of the scarcity or the lack of my knowledge, it's actually not wrong. It could be fine. So the importance of, of ilm, knowledge, right, that precedes any activism. So is it wrong? Is it really wrong? Does the Sharia say it's wrong? How sure am I? How stable am I? How grounded am I in my knowledge to know that it is wrong? Number one. Number two is, is it an issue of difference? Because there is no inkar in matters of khilaf. What does that mean? If it's an issue of ijtihad, that means that scholars using the principles of rational 
analysis and Dini analysis, they differ. So it's not an issue of categorical certainty. It's not, if you like, an issue of qata, of definitiveness. It's an issue of probability. And when the probability of right and wrong is available with regard to understanding a hukum or judgment, then scholars may differ. Some may say A, some may say B. Now when that happens, if you have an opinion, you know, you would believe in all probability, using the evidence and the legal and the tools of legal reasoning, I believe I'm right, probabilistically. But there's a chance that I could be wrong. And the other side, I believe, is wrong, probabilistically, but they could be, they could be right. So in an instance like that, there's no, there's no nahi against the munkar, because it's not a munkar. Because if the other side has a semblance of evidence or stands on, you know, has a leg to stand on in terms of evidence, I can say they are wrong and I'm going to do my best to try to stop that or discourage that or prevent that at least intellectually. I can't do that. So the first issue, the first condition here is knowledge. And the extent of knowledge that I have, and then whether this is an issue of ijtihad, of legitimate scholarly difference, or not. So that's the first hurdle and the first step. And that's often one that many of us don't pay heed to. Because when we look at the text, the text doesn't speak about that, literally, does it? But this is part of the understanding of the text within the parameters of, of deen, of other texts, of the objectives of the shara, of the general qawa'id, the general laws that are induced from fiqh. And so the text is read in light of the principles of all of that and the letter of all of that as well. Number two, let's say there is a wrong. So let's say the first hurdle is hopped over, right? It's a wrong. It's, it's, it's definitively, categorically wrong. No scholarly difference about it. Khairan. Number two is, is there, is there, will there be a benefit in me enjoining it or discouraging it? Is there a probable benefit? Because I can't enjoin something or forbid something which is right to do, but that produces no benefit or a greater harm. Are you with me? So the analysis in terms of the probable outcome, and ulama deem this to be the ma'al, at the end result, right, the conclusion. So probabilistically speaking, if I do this, if I act in this way, what are the probable consequences of my action? So that is an essential part of, of, scholarly, you know, of scholarly advice and of activism at every level. Because that is very much a part of the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. That that's part of our deen, the rational edifice of our deen compels us as students, and of course as, as teachers, that we have to always think ahead what are the probable outcomes. And if the, art, and, and, and if the outcomes are bad or deleterious or harmful, then I shouldn't, I shouldn't do that. I shouldn't act. Because the whole idea of acting is not to simply say truth for the sake of truth, but to produce benefit to produce maslaha. Now that analysis, that probabilistic analysis, that ma'al, it rests on a number of, of maturities. It rests on my maturity in ilm. True or false, right? That is that, you know, I'm able to assess, is this something which is wrong, definitively wrong? It rests on my maturity in terms of uh, intellect, you know, am I, am I intelligent enough to make these rational judgments? 
it rests on my maturity of experience in life. Right? Because if I don't know much about life, and if I don't know much about the psychology of human beings, and the way in which they react and interact, and what to expect from them, and the particular person that I'm dealing with, or group I'm dealing with, if I don't know about that, I'm not experienced and mature in life, then I won't know the probable consequences of doing something. Because that requires knowledge of, of life, maturity of life, of experience. Not only scholarship, not only intelligence and rationality. And then also my spiritual maturity. Because I want to realize spiritual benefit. I don't simply want to do things for the sake of imposing law. But in order to create benefit and, most importantly, not only material benefit, but spiritual benefit. So how sensitive am I spiritually? So all of these are included in the مَنْ رَأَى مِنْكُمْ مُنْكَرًا فَلْيُغَيِّرْهُ بِيَدِي It's all included, uh, encompassed within the understanding of this text. And the ulama are all in agreement about that. No difference of opinion. That this analysis is the true Islamic rational analysis which must take place. Number three. فَلْيُغَيِّرْهُ بِيَدِي Let him change it with his hand. Well, the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is to always begin with gentleness. Always begin with gentleness. In Allah rafiqun yuhibbu rifq Allah is gentle and he loves gentleness. And Allah gives through gentleness what he doesn't give with, with unf, with harshness. Or through any other means. A beautiful text from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and very wide-ranging implications. Because the methodology of change, the methodology of change in our deen, is always begin with gentleness. Always. And when you look at his seerah, sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam, he always began like that. Always. In every instance. With Muslims, with non-Muslims, with people of the book. Always. Politically, socially, the family level, militarily, always begin with rifq. Because the hadith says Allah, Allah loves rifq and Allah gives through the channel of gentleness of results, of, of goodness, of welfare, of benefit. What Allah doesn't give through the channels of harshness or through any other channel. And only when you look at the seerah, only when it was impossible because people were so adamant and obstinate and stubborn and so hostile and violent did he resort to another means, sallallahu alayhi wa because of situational and contextual necessity. But he always began, sallallahu alayhi wa with rifq, because that was his way. Right? وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ Always began with that broad principle. And therefore the means to do that, because the text doesn't speak about the means, but understanding the text in context of the other ulum that we mentioned, right, necessitates beginning like that. With lutf, with kindness, with gentleness, with forbearance, with tact, right, with mercy, right, with wisdom, with gradualism, all of that encompassed within rifq. And lastly, Imam uh, Al-Ghazali he mentions this and it's so profound. This is just, I mean, everything that he says, again, we've mentioned it before and we should mention it again, that it's the voice of a father of external outward scholarship and a master of the internal states of the heart. It's the scholar saint and you don't get better than outward scholarship and inward scholarship combined. He says, you must be concerned about your own intentions. Profound. That is, the one who is enjoining or prohibiting, let him first look, let her first look inside themselves, what is their motive for doing that? Is the motive sincerely for Allah? Is the motive pride? Is the motive uh, delusion? and self-aggrandizement, 
is the motive uh, to be seen uh, to be seen riya ostentation. So if he or she finds that in their heart, they should not enjoin or discourage. And that makes rational sense because enjoining good and discouraging evil is a far kifaya. It's not obligatory on every single human being to do that. Right? But protecting myself from sin outwardly and inwardly is a fardain. So I can't save someone and, for want of a better word, damn myself. And therefore, he says, if inside of you, you find these diseases, then you should enjoin good on yourself first before others. And you should prevent and discourage harm in yourself first before imposing it upon others. Very profound and beautiful and spiritual and rational. And then lastly, just um, by way of connecting this beautiful science and discussion to spirituality and akhlaq. So it should be now clear to me and you and all of us that the enterprise of enjoining good and discouraging wrong rests on so if you get this you know when we were in madrasa and teaching students you tell the student if you get it right we'll get you I'll buy you Nando's <laughs> because all of the Nando's are halal in South Africa and you got it from from us there I'm Canadian too but here I'm gonna take pride at <laughs> you know halal outlets so and then the students, they'd be tired, sleepy, late, at na late in the afternoon doing fiqh. And then everyone would jump up, you know, focus, because they want, they want food. So I, I, would, I would offer you that as, a, as an incentive. So the enterprise of enjoining the good and forbidding the evil, it rests on, what do you think, spiritually speaking? Intention, Intention indeed. What else? Rahma. Rahma, yes. And Rahma and? Knowledge and, so in general, akhlaq. Akhlaq. It's ajib when you think about it. Why? Because it needs ilm. Ilm is akhlaq. It needs what? Lutf, gentleness, akhlaq. Rahma, akhlaq. Hilm, forbearance, akhlaq. Wisdom, akhlaq. Right? Um, ihsan, akhlaq. So this enterprise rests on akhlaq and akhlaq rests on what experiential tawheed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and having my qalb that is is cleansed and can see the truth can experience the truth and can will the truth that produces beautiful akhlaq and now we're speaking about activism more generally and this could be you know the hadith for the activist but properly understood and this rests on activism, if you like. Let's speak about political, whatever you like, social, economic activism, right? This rests on the edifice of the rational sciences of our deen and akhlaq, which rests on experiential tawheed, which is tazkiyah and spirituality. And that's how it's all wondrously, no? Don't you get goosebumps? It's wondrously wondrously connected in a beautiful tawhidic way through the, the spiritual legacy of our deen. If we have some time, I'd mention something else, but our timekeeper, I violated his rights the last 10 days. How much time do we have? Eight minutes. Shall we mention something else? Okay. Just by way of this, one of our teachers uh, Hafizahullah, uh, a man of, of profound ilm and a man of profound spirituality. He gave us this advice once about speaking. So speaking is included in, 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 you know, in changing a munkar. So he said, this is what the scholar or the teacher or the student of ilm needs to consider before they speak on an issue of uh, counseling someone not to do that or to do that. Number one, is it, is it truly the case in ilm, which we covered now? 
So you know, when I say you must do that, is it true? If I say don't do that, is it true? Meaning from an ilmi perspective, do I have enough knowledge to even know that? Number two is, right, uh, probable consequences, and we did that. To assess my words, what are the consequences of my words? Yes, what I could say is true, but it, create, it could create more harm, in which case I should zip, right? Uh, so that analysis of probable consequences, you know, and that's based on, again, my knowledge of deen, my intellectual ability, my life ability and my life experience, my understanding of psychology and so forth. Number three is, let's say it's, it's wrong. Let's say, yes, I think in my analysis that if I mention it in a gentle, kind way, there will be benefit and there will be the realization probable of benefit. Two. Number three is, can the person understand what I say? Right? Can he understand what I say? Because some people can. Can he understand what I say and therefore should I speak about this in detail or in summary? I have to, I have to go through that analysis as well. Because I can't give someone detail if they can't understand detail. Right? And if they need detail, I can't give it to them summarily. So I have to make that assessment as a student of ilm as well. Then, if tick, 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 the fifth tick, right, what's my niya? And he said, so I don't have the spiritual lineage or pedigree to say this, but it's coming from him. He said, few of us consider these, one, two, three, four, and fewer consider this one. What's my intention? You know, is there a drive of my nafs? Is there a portion, a half of my nafs in this? And if there is, then what should I do? <laughs> Zip. And Allah will find someone else because I'm not indispensable. I should never think that I am indispensable. Allah will find someone else to remedy that in a beautiful way. But my, my, my essential job is to make sure that my fard ain is met with my heart. And I should not go about preaching to others and imposing my, my view on others and judging others until I have my inside satisfactorily maintained and, uh, and uh, observed and assessed. So if I find that I'm doing it because of pride or arrogance or delusion or ostentation, right, or anger, then I should refrain. And that's very difficult. And only if all of those five are met, does the true student of ilm or the true scholar speak. Imagine that. Imagine a world like that. Imagine a world like that where I don't shoot my mouth or I shoot from the hip I disagree with someone, I speak. I've got my own view, I speak. I think it's wrong, it's not wrong, I speak. I think it's wrong, but I haven't done any assessment of harm, I speak more harm, greater harm, and what I want to alleviate is still there, or worse. Or I speak and I'm filled with pride, I'm filled with ostentation, and I'm saying that not for Allah, not for nearness to Him, but simply for lowly, lowly base motives and reasons. So what would life be like? How would our community be? How would our, you know, our, our hearts be better connected? Um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows, and it of course begins with me. Begins with me. These are all principles that inshallah we should apply. We ask Allah azza wa jal, uh, in what we have learned and shared uh, in these past lessons, if there was any good in it, it's from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Anything that was incorrect or improper or uh, inappropriate is from my weakness uh, and the impact of shaitan upon me. I seek refuge in Allah azza wa jal, that I should remind you of him and I should forget him myself. I seek refuge in him that I should remind you to work and to act and I should, uh, and I should not be the foremost in working and doing and acting. Please forgive me for any indiscretion. 
May Allah Azza wa make us of those who listen and follow the best of what they hear. And may Allah Azza wa make us of those who internalize all of the beautiful lessons of Imam Ghazali, rahimullah, uh, and make us of those who, more importantly, do them and act on them and live by them and make them a live reality in our lives with our hearts and with our deeds. Jazakumullah khairan for giving me the opportunity to be here. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. Thank you for listening to this Seekers Hub podcast. To listen to the rest of our shows, please visit seekershub.fm. You can also subscribe to our weekly email newsletter called Compass, where we'll send the best of Seekers Hub's content straight to your inbox every single week. To get on the list, visit seekershub.org slash compass.